AI. And um, we've gone through um, a lot of uh, different um, webinars on the different departments and specific important uh, topics for us in the School of Management. Um, and for those of you who are joining um, us for the first time today, you are very welcome. And also to people who are um, uh, maybe um, not, not from UJ, um, you are also very welcome. So just very briefly, the School of Management is one of six schools within the College of Business and, and Economics in the University of Johannesburg. And in the School of um, Management, we have four uh, departments. Um, we have the Department of Business Management, the Department of Industrial Psychology, People Management, Financial and Investment Management, and then the department who's in the spotlight today, the Department of Transport and Supply Chain Management. So um, we um, uh, service about uh, by about 7,000 students in School of Management um, through about 200 staff members, and we offer uh, programs from diploma, certificates, postgrad, undergrad, up to doctoral studies, and we also have a big contingent of continued education programs. So um, I would like to um, hand over to uh, the department head of Transport Supply Chain Management, Professor Nalene Pisa, and um, I would like to ask her to continue with this conversation and uh, thank you for uh, this very interesting topic uh, of today. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing uh, you and your co-presenter on, on what you are going to share with us today. So over to you, Nolene. Uh, thank you, Prof. Audrey. Afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us in today's webinar. Um, I've known Mr. Ofense um, for a few months now. Uh, we've been working together. He's a very active transport economist who is currently pursuing his PhD at Fitz University. Um, he's recently joined Uber uh, and we are very honored to have him co-present and host this webinar. Um, with me today and as you are aware the title of the webinar is the impact of disruptions on mobility and supply chains um, and this is a topic that we've both found to have had significant and profound implications both for businesses and in our personal livelihoods as individuals. Um, as you are all aware you have received offenses um, Bio, but we're very honored to have him uh, on board and for him to partner with us um, in collaboration with Uber and have perspectives from industry. Uh, his vast industry experience is going to be invaluable and he'll share later on in the presentation. So I will start by providing some context and background uh, on today's topic. Um, I'll quickly share my screen. We can't see your screen on me. Okay. There we go. I've already introduced the topic, uh, but obviously all of us have an idea of what a disruption is. Uh, in the business context, we talk about disruptions being interruptions to normal business operations uh, that result in malfunction and disorder. This can arise as a result of different factors, uh, including uh, equipment failure, malfunctions, um, supply failure. In a broader and macroeconomic context, this can be as a result of uh, four broad categories, which I'll get into a bit more detail uh, later on in the presentation. So basically, we're saying that risk arising from disruptions to normal activities is what we categorize as disruptions to business operations. Uh, particularly, we are focusing on disruptions to mobility and supply chain. As you can see on the left hand side, uh, mobility includes all movement of passengers and goods within an economy. This includes all modes of transportation, uh, motorized and non-motorized uh, passenger transportation, as well as all freight transportation modes. 
So whatever happens to disrupt the efficient and effective movement of these modes, we term uh, disruption. In the term of supply chains, we refer to supply chain as the different activities that are involved from the acquisition of raw materials, uh, transportation, uh, production, all the way until those goods are made available to our up to the point where those goods are made available to a consumer for purchase and where they consume them in their own um, spaces, be it home or work environments. Uh, so as you can imagine, disruptions cause discontinuation to the effective operations of the various supply chain activities. Um, this can be categorized as supply shocks, distribution shocks or demand shocks. Uh, as you can see right at the bottom in red uh, at the bottom of the figure the supply shocks will encompass different elements and can include the lack of raw materials being um, available to manufacturing sites lack of parts lack of workforce uh, distribution constraints can include trade restrictions again lack of labor force and resultant closing of facilities and then demand shocks are characterized by the responses of consumers um, in reaction to the disruptions in the supply chain. This may result in things like hoarding, as we've seen uh, in March 2020, where people were hoarding toilet paper and so forth uh, to try and counter uh, future shortages that will be experienced. On the mobility side, mobility we have characterized as the movement of passengers and goods and services in the economy. Disruptions to mobility resulting or arising from, for example, infrastructure failure. We are all aware of um, the collapse of the M1 bridge a few years ago. This disrupts mobility and results in road closures. Uh, in some instances, obviously, fatalities are incurred and people lose lives. Um, disruptions also result in some instances, the lack of um, mobility completely, as we have seen recently with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So what are the causes of these disruptions? Uh, they vary and have varying impacts. Um, the thing about disruptions is they present risks to businesses. And as a result, businesses are always endeavoring to try and predict and control and contain these risks. We are all aware we're currently under the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we all, to varying extents, have experienced the impacts of COVID-19, both to our mobility and to the access of goods and services. From a global perspective, COVID-19 has restricted trade. Uh, there was a point in time where exports were not, um, where countries could not participate in trade and uh, there was a complete stop in both imports and exports. Uh, it has resulted in blockages in the various supply chain links as a result of the lockdown restrictions, which inhibited or minimized the movements of uh, people for personal uh, work and the movement of goods themselves. Geopolitics has got a significant impact on supply chains and mobility itself. As we are well aware recently, uh, the takeover of the Afghan economy by the Taliban uh, was seen to have um, dramatic impact on mobility as citizens of Afghanistan battled to leave the country for their own safety. Resultantly, we can imagine that it has significant impacts on the risk profile of the country, as well as the resultant um, trickle down effect on operations of business and operations of supply chains. In recent years, we've seen uh, the trade wars emerging uh, between the US and China. Uh, this resultantly eroded many years of progress in terms of trade liberalization and ensuring that uh, countries can uh, liberalize trade. Uh, however, because of differing agendas, these geopolitics have significant impacts on trade 
on countries resultantly. Similarly, we've seen um, the effect of Brexit. It has come, finally come into effect. And as a result, in the last few months, we've seen um, the knock-on effect on the British economy with truck driver shortages uh, as migrant workers from the European Union have left Britain. And as a result, this has had a knock-on effect on the supply chain as goods and services are not being delivered because trucks are not moving. Again, political economics, this is uh, not news to any of us. We've seen the recent looting in South Africa, how it has brought the economy to almost to its knees at some point and has raised the risk profiles uh, of companies as well as the country as a whole. Um, this significantly impacts the perception of investors on the South African economy, resulting in that having trickle effects on the supply chains in the long run. Border delays are another form of disruption in the supply chain and to mobility of goods and of goods and people. Uh, we've seen the Swiss Canal, the backlog, uh, the impact it has had on world trade and on specific companies. It has resulted in companies not having their goods delivered in time, resulting in supply shortages in factories and actual um, lack of order fulfillments for specific customers. Another economic factor that results in disruption could be power supply. We are all aware of the impact of power supply disruptions in South Africa or South African businesses. It has significantly impacted operational costs and reliability of operations for companies. And as a result, this cost ends up uh, rising the cost of production for companies as they seek alternative sources of energy to ensure continued supply. Technological factors also impact um, and result in disruptions, uh, cyber attacks and infrastructure damage or depreciation have an impact and result in disruptions in the supply chains. Uh, Transnet recently uh, declared a state of force majeure after it experienced cyber attacks which disabled its infrastructure, IT infrastructure, resulting in port closures. Uh, the knock-on effect is many businesses ended up diverting some of their cargo and this builds costs in the supply chain. So in summary, our disruptions are also known as supply chain risks and they are categorized as demand or operational risks. And as you can see in the figure, their probability has been classified uh, by the author Rodriguez 2020, uh, and those with high probability are shown in red. And interestingly enough, uh, pandemics have got a low probability. However, we have seen that their impact is quite significant and widespread. Included in geopolitical factors are also terrorism, theft and piracy. Uh, and um, among economic factors, we can also include current fluctuations, uh, price volatility, amongst others. However, history has shown that change is the stimulus to progression. So, as Bernard Shaw said, progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. The secret to change is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building new. So I'll hand over to Mr. Offense to provide us a business perspective of the impact of these disruptions. What have been some of the major disruptions and what have been the learnings from these disruptions? Have they brought change? Have they resulted in closures of businesses? Have they resulted in new innovations? I hand over to Offenser to take us forward in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Prof. I appreciate it. Um, what an amazing uh, background. <laughs> I want to just share my screen um, so that we can 
Let's see. Great. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Yes, we can see it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, so what's really interesting is that I just want to show a little bit of a of a longer term market overview. And from there, uh, touch on how COVID-19 is potentially a great example of how disruptions actually work and essentially argue that the shifts in consumer behavior are fundamentally pooling supply chains in a different direction over and above what we the, the, the trend that was coming up um, which was taking the form of a, of a push type of format and from there talk a little bit about some of the emerging trends and for everyone who's in the audience, th the whole idea is actually to build up to one question. So you can already start guessing what the question is, maybe in the chat box. Um, <laughs> but there's there's one question at the end that I think might be very interesting for, for our audience. So just to start, some markets are more volatile than others, but it is also important for us to break break the averages and move beyond the averages. So when we look at the South African market from, an, from a freight and passenger transport perspective, the income for the freight transport market has relatively been stable, but it has been on a an, on an significant incline. The big dip that we see is either in the the lag effect of the 2008 financial crisis, or it is when we had a little bit of a of a supply issue um, towards 2015 in, in that in that scenario, and we also then start seeing a dip for or within the context of COVID-19, and this is in the freight context. But the freight market wasn't as significantly impacted as the passenger market from an income perspective, and here what we see is that the massive dips were in, in so the, early, the early 2010s or so 2013, and then we see a dramatic collapse in, in the market when we get to um, 2020, so the lockdown. And the issue is, you know, the process of recovering from the lockdown is, is really uh, fundamental. But the the way in which the markets reacted was very different for road and rail transport. And this is what I think is, is really interesting to, to look at, especially from a long-term horizon perspective. And when we look at it from a ratio perspective, so here it's really just a traditional index where taking the same timeline, and I'm showing that the, the, the four passenger journey index is relatively more volatile than the revenue per ton index for a number of reasons. In, in the passenger context, the, the data is dominated by metro rail data, so passenger rail data, and also the bus market only represents about, actually only represents about 20% of the, the passenger mobility market in general, whereas rail also represents less than 10% of the market. The data that we have does not include dominant players like your minibus taxi um, uh, operators and also ride hailing and again other shuttle type services that are embedded in the market. And from a from a revenue ton perspective, the index does show relative stability, but the road freight market is the one that has a higher volatility. And this is driven by the strength and by and large, the traditional economic model that we're seeing in Transnet, which is fundamentally a big monopoly um, within the railway space. And this is also starting to change. So with this in mind, when we move beyond the averages, a crisis takes the form of a virus any type of crisis, because it spreads in different ways to different parts of our value chains. 
not just our supply chains, but our value chains in general. So that would include the organizational values. It would include our suppliers' values. It would include our consumers' values as well and how they're interconnected in with respect to the virus or with respect to a crisis that emerges. So um, I'm sure you can recall that there was a CEO of a specific organization who was involved in the looting. And that raises some questions about the societal values that are embedded and what drives a crisis and how that crisis spreads from a strike on highways impacting on some of the contractual obligations for the freeway uh, companies, freeway concession companies, how that explodes into a nationwide looting exercise that resulted in other types of ripple effects that we did not expect, questioning our value systems as well. So when we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, there's some really interesting things that um, practitioners in the virus prevention space, especially in the transport context, there's some interesting points of contact that we look at. So I'm going to refer to these points of contact and I'd like you to really think about what they mean even in a different context and not just the COVID-19 context. For example, the engineering controls are these actions that are related to separating people from contamination. If you look at the transnet, the transnet um, breach or even the Marisk breach a couple of years ago, it, it was an issue about having the right hard controls to prevent access to the mainframes or access to the servers. And this was an engineering exercise. So you had to prevent, find a way to make sure that your servers are physically protected from contamination. In the COVID-19 context, it has to do with actual hardcore interventions that involved and that actually affected the way in which the port operations were structured. So port schedules also had to be shifted. Um, and also the other hard measures were related to what was happening at, at the border posts where we saw significant changes in the hard instruments that were used. But we're also being forced to again, reconsider the way in which we are managing our borders as well. So very helpful that we have the border management agency and the one stop border post proposals in the pipeline, um, but the implementation was really going to be helpful because when you move on to the administrative controls, the public has to be trained to respond to a specific event. And that event might be happening now, might, might happen in the future or might have happened in the past. So organizations had to facilitate drills for a fire or some kind of activity. But society itself, we it's been a long time since we've seen large scale drills for a crisis, like say when you go to Bogota and you've got a, a, a giant earthquake or a volcanic eruption, countries are actually practicing evacuation strategies on a day to day basis, on a month to month basis to basically predict the way in which the transport and supply chain markets are actually going to respond to this and how to retain a level of resilience. This has changed the way in which travel demand management takes place in different cities. And then we have issues like personal protective equipment. For us, we just say PPEs and you put on the mask. But these items actually need to be procured. So there's a massive supply chain element related to when a crisis occurs or emerges and how the crisis is responded to from a procurement perspective. And we saw that some commodities had this massive hike in prices, largely because they were in such high demand. And the challenge that we're faced with, from a, at least from a, from a goods perspective, is gearing our markets up or gearing our businesses up for scenarios where essential goods are going to be in high demand. The challenge, however, is that each crisis will present a different type of essential good. So the protests that we had, for instance, truck driver strikes that we had, for instance, required a different set of items for law enforcement 
over and above the items that were needed by the trucking companies that wanted to ensure that their drivers could either protect themselves or protect, protect the vehicles or the assets. So in each scenario, the kind of protective equipment or preventative measures are very, very different. And they all have to be supplied somewhere or another. In the public passenger transport context, it's even more intense because in this instance, you've got high contact points, many passengers, many people who are using the services. But in order to facilitate, you know, the right kind of personal protective personal protective equipment, you might have to change the physical design of the vehicle. So have the screens between passengers or screens between the driver and the passenger. And we've seen that in the ride hailing space, but we're also seeing that as a practice in, in the public passenger transportation context as well. And this has other implications from a capacity perspective, which I'll talk about when I get to social distancing. Then we have environmental hygiene in general. Broadly speaking, this ripples out into the kind of day to day practices that need to be employed. So imagine organizations that are supplying cleaning equipment, um, the kind of liquids, the chemicals that need to be produced and had to be supplied in order for in order to ensure that, you know, we have clean environments today, but also assess the extent to which this type of market is going to be sustainable in the long run. So the sanitizer market is booming ex exceptionally, and it's actually turning into its own type of technology space, if not a niche service for, say, aircrafts or airlines to basically guarantee that they have, you know, lab grade cleansing cleansing systems or cleaning systems within their passenger spaces and this is becoming like a really big selling point for some private airlines but it's also becoming a a, a recurring topic in the public space because most people are now used to sanitizing their hands even children are asking hey when am i going to start sanitizing my hand then social distancing is another measure that was really interesting for the pandemic, but it is also an interesting measure when you look at it in a, in a broader context. So social distancing um, reduces the capacity of, basically reduces the, the traditional capacity that's at the base of any service. So if a bus or a train could carry, you know, 65 passengers, 1,200 passengers, the capacity base would be reduced and the assets use utilization would obviously be reduced as well. And that would require even greater physical supply and probably an even higher cost. And that changes the way in which the subsidy frameworks or the patronage guarantees or any type of financial arrangement is structured, especially when you're looking at the relationship between the revenue per seat kilometer and the cost per seat kilometer when you're implementing a social distancing measure. But when you take it outside of the COVID-19 pandemic, it actually translates into a situation like what we saw at the ports. Our ports early on had a had a significant backlog of non-essential goods that was also coupled by a change in the in the shifts of the employees. So if I remember correctly, um, uh, our petroleum side, so Transnet pipelines had to reduce its staff profile to and so that it can accommodate the scheduling reforms and 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 become more and more compliant with what was required for the COVID-19 pandemic. But that in and of itself resulted in these massive changes in the way in which business is done. You look at what was happening with the Suez Canal, something similar. The delays actually resulted in a scenario where companies had to make an optimization choice around is the waiting time worth, is the waiting time worth the cost of the delay vis-a-vis -vis the value of the product? And again, the cost of actually rerouting or basically restructuring the way in which they're going to provide their service. Then ventilation is a bit of a hard one because ventilation has to do with the characteristics of the crisis itself. So the pandemic was an airborne disease. But if you look at a data breach, that is a, that is basically an infection that is virtual and closing service at, 
having distributed server networks and closing servers very rapidly is one way to make sure that you can contain you can contain a spread. But Marisk strategy was very very helpful because what they did was after realizing that there is a breach, they overhauled the entire platform, and that resulted in them in some instances insourcing some solutions and in other instances outsource, outsourcing core solutions within a distributed frame because the cost of having a distributed network as a multinational might be lowered at scale but for regional companies or, or say SSA type companies it's very very difficult for them to secure that type of, of capacity. So that's where companies like um, you know AWS and other cloud computing platforms are really, really helpful, and they're an asset on a global scale. And the last two uh, I've already touched on. So business operations is really how companies and organizations respond on the ground to the changes that are required when you're responding to some kind of crisis, um, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a shock, um, or it is a, a natural disaster, given the fact that climate change is, is, is by and large encroaching upon us. And contract tracing similar, it has to do with the capacity for companies to reverse engineer what happened leading up to a specific event. So say for example, you look at the the massive hike in container prices companies the container companies are the ones who actually kept the price from hiking just because they believed that for for the economy to work efficiently and effectively it would be unfair for them to continue or to allow the market forces to persist so they had to backtrack on what was already happening and this was a really interesting step um, when you look at it from a cost benefit analysis perspective. Some would say they've made enough profits. So what happened with the lockdown in, 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 in South Africa? A lot of changes took place. So um, changes in the retail market, there was very limited, um, very limited trips to retail areas, 79% reduction there. And that really propelled the growth in online grocery and online retail uh, markets. Then a 60% decline in grocery and pharm pharmacy trips. And that produced a whole new market, which was already there, but now it's just much larger um, of a market around grocery deliveries, a market around um, food deliveries, door-to-door -door kind of services at scale. And then we saw a 55% reduction in you know, park visits or recreation activities, whereas globally there was a big upsurge in tactical urbanism that's local, local neighborhood planning to stimulate development and local activity. Then we also saw a 80% reduction in the use of our public transportation facilities, so registered transit stations. And what we're seeing on the other hand is that minibus taxi facilities were, were still being used, um, but not necessarily as much as what they were used before. But the reduction is not the same as what we're seeing in the passenger rail and bus uh, type facilities. Then again, 49% reduction in workplace trips. So this is people wanting to go to work and make that traditional commute. Today, we're seeing a lot of virtual work. This seminar is virtual, um, and but it's propelling what we'd call the human cloud. So work in the virtual space, but also work that is attached to uh, platforms or marketplaces. And it's changing the way in which the commodity markets are also responding. And the residential trips actually went up mid the pandemic. So that's a 24% increase in local trips. And this also translated into, you know, more and more people walking, jogging, cycling, hiking, and doing all kinds of other non-motorized mobility related activities. So the big challenge is understanding that a, a major crisis will have a negative influence on consumer confidence, and therefore on corporate investment programs and on budget allocations between organizations and households, but also for infrastructure service and therefore the demand market also starts to suffer. 
but reduction in demand, here we go into the cycle, and increase in financing costs may result in increased tariffs, and the vicious cycle starts. Increased tariffs start to change the way in which demand is structured, and this will be subject to the elasticity of that specific market. So this is Jeffrey Delman, and anyone who knows Jeffrey um, would, would, would probably appreciate his, his insights. So some of the trends um, to close are that, you know, ARK Investing estimates that the deflationary risk is a big thing, where the, when the pandemic hit, there was an inflationary risk for specific commodities. So certain commodities had a massive price hike. But now those commodities are contracting, uh, largely because households are partly moving back into their normal routine, so-called normal. And the traditional goods are now entering an upsurge. And we're going to see that in the supply chain space where there's upward pressure for, for traditional commodities or traditional goods. And so we're seeing both of these activities taking place at the, at the same time for different commodities, some deflationary risk and also consumer inflation risk, especially um, CPI that's driven by the change in the oil producers frameworks as well, because they have to now up their production and the currency market is not as healthy as what it used to be as well. So then the other side is that there's a, there's a significant degree of pent up tourism demand and this is especially for the aviation space, but also for long distance travel. And the risk here is that the, if um, input demand starts to outpace supply, and this refers specifically to the hotel industry or the hospitality industries, where you've got a lot of goods that are usually pulled in by, 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 by the hotel companies. This is food, catering, um, cleaning and washing equipment, et cetera. And that was down. Now it has to you know, catch up again. So there might be some upward pressure there, but also coupled with what would happen in, in the aviation space when global travel picks up at scale. And another thing that's picking up is there's a big rise in the proximity to consumers. So the so social media and other types of platforms are providing third party providers with greater access to customers without them really owning anything in between. So these are dark grocery platforms, dispatch solutions that are attached to social networks. So that's a replacement for the CRM, but also have the capacity to provide commercial decision support systems. And what this means is basically many companies are, or many micro companies are starting to outsource um, ERP, uh, enterprise resource planning systems, but they're actually not doing that at all. They are just tapping into a provider who is providing warehousing and distribution on their behalf. And what they do is they provide the sales point. You're seeing this on Facebook, uh, Facebook retail platform, Instagram's retail platform. And you also see that with some of the some of the sites that are coming in, like Wix, that has a built in distribution and a product development um, aspect to it. And we're also seeing um, a shift in how households and society is working. So the rise in the human cloud is really presenting a vast array of opportunities where you've got services and goods that are coming in a an ecosystem that has by and large unknown um, implications. But what we know is that the household and prosumer patterns are fundamentally going to change with respect to the crisis and any crisis that comes up along the way. But this changes the way the value chain actually works. And last but not least, we are seeing a growth in low capital, but high value supply chain um, management systems or management decisions. So um, some companies are choosing to reduce their capital spend from a, from a physical asset perspective and invest more in the digital capacity, whether it's for payments or it's for providing third party providers with access to their platforms and so on and so forth. And the big one here is 
the bigger shift towards a net zero supply chain. So really there, there are increasing networks and platforms that are providing suppliers, first, second and third tier suppliers with better insights around what is the emissions profile of your first, second, third or fourth tier provider. So this is really highlighting how we are becoming number one, more integrated and number two, we're becoming more and more sensitive to the, the, the advent of climate change. So the question on the floor um, is, this might be something that you want to think about, is which of these trends could stand the test of time? And I I'd like to thank you all for, for the opportunity to share and, and also for your attention. Um, that, that ends my, my presentation. Thank you very much, Akinke. Um, does are there any questions? Do we have any views on that question that was posed at the end in terms of the trends? Is anyone brave enough to <laughs> to to give an answer? We won't hold you to it. <laughs> With all the uncertainty going around, I think people are very cautious to make <laughs> to, to commit to something. But if anybody has any views, ah, thank you very much. Tatenda. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair, and also thank you very much, the presenters. Uh, I offense. <laughs> You, you you raised an you raised an interesting point. I, I'm not actually uh, responding to to the question you raised at the end, but I also want to respond to one of uh, your statements you made in terms of uh, the one border uh, post. Well, this has been talked about, if I can say, from time immemorial. Do you really believe that this will be implemented? What is holding <laughs> the implementation of a one border post? Hey, Prof, I appreciate your question. Um, so a, a quick a quick response. The one border post policy has been, yes, on the table for quite some time. And it required a, an institutional framework that works. And that is where the border management agency is actually an asset. So the prerequisite, at least from what we've assessed in the DTI was, the prerequisite is have a right policy framework that gives the right powers beyond cross border and then use that to drive the one border post policy. But it requires capital investment. It requires the right kind of deals. And I think you'd be the one to to drive that, um, <laughs> you know, part time, probably if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other other questions or remarks? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I think from my end, the lean supply chains are something that should pick up, particularly in Africa and in a developing country context uh, where, you know, resources are scarce and limited and unemployment is rife. I think there's ample opportunity for entrepreneurship uh, to take advantage of these concepts and create uh, new channels of job creation and service provision. And I think this is something that can really go a long way in addressing um, our socioeconomic challenges uh, in developing countries. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you, uh, Nolin. Uh, Peter? Hi, everybody. Uh, Ufensi, uh, I would like to get your view on how the retail space will change in terms of physical infrastructure. Um, I mean, we've seen the, during 
lockdown, lockdowns across the globe, we've seen uh, very new customer behavior in terms of uh, a variety of goods. Most uh, importantly, uh, those goods that, uh, that we all uh, deal with on a daily basis, your FMCG goods. Um, we've seen across the globe huge impact on conventional retail uh, environments and uh, you know I I would foresee that you know some of the changes we've seen will will remain and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that that environment pan out and I would like to get your opinion on this uh, how will the conventional or the traditional retail distribution channels as we know it change and especially at the at the front end of the store end uh, how do you see that Yeah, thank you for that. I think so. The the two principal um, trends that that have been in the pipeline for quite a while. The first one is the the convenience store. So the hyper convenience, the hyper convenience store where you you enter the retail platform and there there's basically enter and you've got an auto checkout that has a biometric frame and has a very advanced RFID type of um, technology embedded in it. The other frame is where you have a high quality retail experience that's designed to keep the customer at the store, you know, looking at options, trying to buy more, trying to buy more, trying to buy more. But these particular type of retail experiences are uh, are also going into a stage where they're developing pop-ups. So these are random, you know, appearances and lots of demand for that. But on the other hand, they are long-standing, high-quality, high-value brands. So it's not just the shop itself; it's actually the brand. So to answer you directly, the long-run outlook for the the store outlet, the storefront, is very, very difficult to pick up because what we're seeing is that different consumers are certainly purchasing uh, products in different ways. And it's a matter of factoring in the extent to which a specific geography has individuals who want to order frozen food online or has people who want to order alcohol online and get that delivered to their home or people who prefer to go and touch the broccoli and the tomato and the banana and make sure that it's as fresh as what they expect. So it's really about creating the right kind of profile for a business that wants to either do both distribute door to door or and or provide a retail experience that's on the ground. So it's very interesting from a warehousing perspective as well, that last 100 meter cost profile is also gonna change essentially um, for, the, for, for the retailers. And the big question I think would be, how will the distribution centers of the future be structured? Will they be embedded in the retailer or will they be completely outsourced um, and managed externally? Thank you for that. Um, now the hand is gone. There was a hand up of Karabu. Was your question answered? <laughs> okay, so if, yes, Nolin. Yeah, I think also to just add to that, we also see uh, an emerging trend of D2C distributor to consumer. So I think that's part of the dynamics that Ofense is talking about that Although online has risen, it hasn't uh, replaced traditional. The consumer dynamics are ever changing. And there's also an element of some proportion of the consumer base wanting to go back and reverting. But I think on the business end, retailers have a complex job of defining that optimum, that optimum balance of brick and mortar distribution and online. I think the complex planning is becoming even more complex with the dynamics that are being brought about by these disruptions. Yeah. There was now another hand uh, that's also missing now, bootleg. <laughs> <clears throat> I 
now we have dinghy. Hopefully, dinghy, you stay on your hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll try by all means. Uh, <laughs> it's a great presentation. I just want to get a view on the issue of drone deliveries and adoption in South Africa. You know, is it something that's going to be happening? You know, and also, you know, um, like distribution networks for companies such as Tesla, because I see in America and China, there's a lot of, you know, these self-driving cars and charging uh, charging station EVs, electric vehicles. And in South Africa, I don't really see it being adopted. What could also be the reason for that? Thank you. That's, that's a tough one. Um, so dro drone deliveries at a, in, in our context, could work certainly um, but but there are some other regulatory requirements that we have to really you know pay attention to that that's really crucial um, but say we, we get through the regulatory frame and we start you know really pushing this globally the difficulty is what constitutes a good quality delivery from a drone perspective. Um, it can work in a closed estate or some kind of complex. Um, it can work in scenarios where you just cannot access these uh, locations. Um, but by and large, I think there's still a bit of work that needs to be done and, and just really searching for high quality opportunities to do that. Um, from a distribution network perspective, this takes me right back to, to um, to uh, Dr. Tatenda's uh, uh, question, you know, our continent requires a deep regional integration um, effort. And as much as we have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, we, we also have to align it with what we need from an energy perspective, what we need from an institutional perspective. So corridor development or integrated value chains is really going to be like a big, big deal for us. And that's going to require, you know, people with different views and countries with different views to come together and 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 actually agree um, that this is essential. And, and you're quite right, the opportunity is there, and China is doing it really well because you know they're an integrated, um, you know, country uh, at scale, uh, but not necessarily as a continent, you know, which is different for us. Uh, if I can also add to that, um, you know, uh, in the department, we have collaborated with the Institute of Intelligent Systems here in UJ, and we've developed a short learning program on drone applications in 4IR. And in that process, you know, the certification for a drone pilot is also quite uh, extensive, and it's one of the major limiting steps for us to get those drone certified pilots it's an issue of capacity as well. So the demand might be there, but certification over and above regulatory requirements remains a major challenge as well. So for us to have people that have the capacity and the funds to be able to go through the training is going to be one of the major limitations that needs uh, addressing. All right, thank you. Any last question, Joash? <clears throat> Hello, good afternoon, Prof. How are you? Uh, thank you, Prof. Nolin, and uh, our offensive for the nice presentation. Uh, now, my my question is uh, uh, is to Vince, and uh, it's about we've seen Uber pronouncing itself very clearly uh, when it comes to issues of uh, maintaining its bottom line uh, by the surging price uh, technique that they're using very well, especially whenever there is any form of disruption, be it weather or a demand increase. We've also seen them pronouncing themselves very well when it comes to uh, issues environmental and uh, looking forward to reduce emissions. But then uh, one thing we understand is that Uber brought about uh, a disruption, especially in the social uh, aspect or social dimension, whereby uh, the traditional employment model was uh, was kind of uh, navigated by Uber. And uh, now we have the drivers uh, there, but we do not know whether drivers should be employees of Uber or they should be self-employed. And we've seen the, 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 the thing happening across the world where some courts have pronounced Uber drivers as employees of 
of women entitled to minimum wage. What do you see? Uh, what's the direction in South Africa? Where is Uber headed to in terms of that? That's a that's a healthy question and uh, highly appreciated. So what we're seeing on a, on a global scale is that the rise of a gig economy is pressing on the type of labor classifications around the world. And the gig economy is not only limited to ride hailing, it's limited to childcare, it's limited to plumbing. It's, um, it also includes um, what we're seeing in the third party delivery market. And so it is quite a broad area. So our position in general is that we will always be compliant with what is available from a legal perspective. However, you have to bear in mind that the future of work is already here. And we're seeing something that globally looks new, gig work, but on our continent, it's not new. Um, we grew up with parents, neighbors, uncles who have been doing gig work. They just haven't had a platform to actually access the kind of opportunities that exist. So we are all in between this conversation and we all look forward to finding a space where we are all in the same space where we really want to see earnings opportunities grow and we want to enable people to really develop their businesses and also develop the opportunities that they can access through the different types of platforms. So it's really a broad, broad, broad market wide kind of um, um, issue. And that's really exciting in my view, you know, that finally we can streamline and support, you know, sectors and households that have never received the kind of support that um, that uh, that that should be part and parcel of what's happening around the world. Think of a part. Think of your car guard. Imagine if there was a way to integrate how car guards are, you know, helping us park, you're giving them five rand. But imagine if all of that was on some kind of app and you could on a monthly basis give them some kind of support. You know, I mean, that would be amazing. Think about the people who are at our intersections, you know, trying to wash your windshield and you say, no, I don't want that. But that could be the difference between having a meal and not having one. You know, this is what's happening there. There is a hidden economy that I think is a massive opportunity, especially within our continent. And streamlining that is what I see um, going forward. Thank you very much, uh, Fancy, and um, that uh, brings us to the end of this webinar. I want to really thank uh, Prof. Nolene and Fancy for this very, very insightful um, presentation and uh, very real and very practical in this new world of work that we are in um, and uh, looking forward to, to see how these trends evolve over time and, and where they, they uh, pan out uh, into the future. So um, Nadine, ach, ach, not Nadine, uh, um, Chanel, sorry, I've, I see Nadine now, yeah, name, name come up on my screen, Chanel, <laughs> Chanel Bloom, thank you very, very much for arranging this, and I also want to say thanks for all six uh, webinars of this year, for all the hard work behind the scenes, we really, really appreciate that, and for everybody who attended, thank you, and uh, look out for the announcements of the first new webinars in 2022, and uh, good luck with the end of the year. Keep well, everybody. Bye-bye all. Thank you.